Hey, Marielle, we are back for part two of Writing Women We Want to Read. That is too many W's, but I'm here for it. How are you? I love me some alliteration. I am good. I am still tired. I still have six kittens. So so if there's any stuttering today in the podcast, it will be cat mom tired. Yes, absolutely. I do feel cat mom tired. So I'm going to just remind everyone that we are jumping into the middle of this and go back and listen to part one. If you haven't yet, we are talking about women we want to read, writing women we want to read. And we are now on words and descriptions to avoid or to reconsider heavily. So I'm just going to jump right in and let's talk about description for a moment. Yes. You ready? Yes. All right. So women, as we're writing, we describe them as authors all the time. There is a lot of emphasis placed on their appearance in TV shows, even in audio productions, they're described. Women are described all the time. Even if there's only one person in the room in a book, the mirror scene is like almost, it it is a trope at this point where you have a woman look in the mirror and then describe herself almost like a third person. Yeah. It it, it is a joke in certain writing circles is, oh, did you have a mirror scene? Oh my gosh. And a lot of writers know that avoiding the mirror scene is suggested because it's usually not written well. It's usually written in the way that a third person would look and it's not good point of view writing. It's not a deep point of view because we look at ourselves differently than someone outside. I don't look at my eye color every time I look at myself in the mirror and that's a signature scene sign of a mirror scene gone wrong. And you'll be like, I'm a luscious woman staring at herself in the mirror. No, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have acne there and oh, I need to fix that curl. Yeah. So and you know what the funny thing is, is that and I actually, because this is something that we talked about previously, right? And I think, I can't remember which episode it was, but I remember telling you about one of my pet peeves, that it was this characters describing themselves at random. So like, she flicked her ginger hair out of the way, or his brown eyes bore down into her green ones. And I'm like, no, because when people ask me what my eye color is, I have to think for a moment. It's not something that is readily available in my head. Yeah, I read a book last night and I'm not going to say the name of it, but it was deep POV of the narrator. So there's no mirrors around. He's in the middle of the woods and he says, my brown, brown eyes watered. And I'm like, you're not even looking at yourself. This is not deep POV writing. This is the mirror scene without a mirror. I call this your POV is slipping. Yes. Would your character actually describe themselves like this? Or is this more an external point of view that you've accidentally slipped in here? A lot of writers, they have a lot of anxiety over, oh, I need to describe my character. It will be okay. It will always be okay. I promise. Yeah, you don't believe you. And and the funny thing is like in my YA fantasy, my female protagonist literally cannot look into mirrors without fainting. So I'm guessing I'm putting that whole scene on its head, right? Because we we do discover what she looks like, but it's by people commenting on it. Like she has a very distinct look and other people compare her to her mother. These people who remember her mother from way back when, They're all like, oh my God, you have to be that hair, those eyes, you have to be this person. So-and-so. Yeah. Yeah. So you make a good point. We, even when we are in deep POV and we're trying to describe the character whose POV we're in, we have so many different options, people's reactions to them. And if you have multiple POVs in a book, then you can use the different POVs to describe whoever's not whoever's being looked at by somebody else is the one that could be described more. I usually let another character meet someone for the first time, or I have something come up where someone like gives someone they've known a long time, a new look, like they change their dress or they go undercover or they cut their hair. And that's a chance to talk about their appearance again in a very natural way. 
though I typically avoid those full body, full descriptions that you often get in like a first chapter of a book. And I just let the pieces show up on their own within the first chapter or three. And then characters change. So I'll be able to revisit those descriptions later on. Like someone comes out of a battle and they're healing. So they've been sick and now they're doing better. These, these kinds of just naturally notice when you notice someone else's appearances yeah. and then weave that in because you don't think my friend with the brown eyes every single time you meet that particular friend after a certain point you don't notice and the same goes for characters with other characters I was just gonna say I'm glad you mentioned the naturalness because indeed when you even when you meet somebody for the first time unless you are very particularly attracted to them you don't give them like you don't do a full body scan right? So yeah. you might, for example, notice that they're wearing an amazing top or that their hair looks freshly cut or their eyes are a very piercing color or unsettling, or you love their shoes, which really stand out, but you don't give a full description. Exactly. Yeah. I also believe, and this, this goes it can go double for female descriptions if you're doing it, but it really covers everyone. That descriptions of someone's physical appearance are one, a place where a lot of feminine language shows up when we're describing female characters. A lot of judgments are often made about yes. said female characters, but it's a chance to, as authors, grow the character development and flesh characters out. For example, in The Queen's Enforcer, under my Sierra Darren pen name, Zafiel is described, the vampire queen is described by several different characters on several different occasions. And it's actually more about fleshing out the POV that's describing her than actually fleshing her out because they're all seeing something different based on what they have. Like I have a military person looking at her and he describes how strong she is, where her weapons are, if she has any, what kind of threat he thinks she is. He's assessing her with his skill sets, but someone else, I have a different character from, say, a female from high society, and she's going to notice a whole different other set of things. So it, it goes both ways, and it's so much fun. If you have a misogynistic character, yes, this is your permission. They're going to use misogynistic language. But as we've said over and over again, you can wrap that misogynistic language in a plot and a commentary that makes it obvious this character is out of line. I love how you phrased it. Like you use it not to flash out the character they're describing, but you use it to flash out your point of view. I think that is really, if you do that well, that really pulls your reader into a story. Because then does. they're fully in this character. So if it all makes sense, of course, like if the sweetest guy you've ever met raised by two feminist women uses a misogynist looks at a woman very in that kind of way then there's like then the pov doesn't align with how you made this character out to be so of course it needs to match but i think if you do it well it can be really really strong it can really really help your writing uh taking it to the next level yeah so i think we've kind of covered that I will say just because this happened so many times in examples I looked at, please don't start women's descriptions by describing her boobs unless you are a doctor doing a mammogram. For one, that's a terrible way to recognize someone by because uh, boob shape changes all the time. New bra, new boob shape, no bra, different profile. I mean, honestly, some of us women have a different bra size depending on where we are in our cycle. So just just don't describe women based on their boobs as a start. Just easy, free tip, everybody. So, uh, yeah, this is an explicit podcast, so I'm just going to say it. I, I want to say something about nipples while we're here, describing women. I did, just that you had to say it like that makes me feel so European. <laughs> okay. Well, if you want to talk about nipples, yes, go ahead, do it. All right. Please never ever write nipples like they are mini penises on somebody's chest. Our nipples do not want twitch in excitement, arousal, or fear any more than male nipples do. 
It's painfully obvious how little some men, even fairly famous male writers, know about the female body. Boobs are not exactly sex organs, to be honest. And in many bras, you can't see nipples through them. So I've, I read a bunch of descriptions of women while I was doing this research where their nipples were like doing things that nipples cannot anatomically do and showing through garments and coats that nipples would not show through. Through coats. Oh, that's I can't painful. quote a book. But let's just say that by the time I was done, I just went and got a cup of coffee and took a walk. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, bodies don't do that. Come on. All mm-hmm. right. So they basically do two things. What? Well, they basically they have, they have like two states or maybe a middle state. They're soft or they're hard. That's it. Yeah. I read this one description where like a woman was peeking around a corner and her nipples like perked up like corgis and like twitched. And I'm like, no, no, they don't do that. Your face is so confused right now. Yeah, I'm just like, I have seen these descriptions and it's, it's, yeah. 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 So uh, um, going on, uh, yes, nipples can be fun. And if you're writing certain books, have at. There are so many things you can do and I'm going to trust you to figure that out yourself. They are also a nice place to hide money, weapon, keys, lockpicks, and other things if they are large enough and you're wearing the right clothes with them. Wait, wait, wait. You talk about boobs here, not nipples anymore. Sorry. Yes, I am. Yes. So moving on from nipples, which are attached to boobs. Basically, you know, too long didn't read or too long didn't listen. Um, (laughs) You can do a lot of fun things with nipples. But nipples themselves cannot do a lot of fun things. Exactly. That's a good way to break that down. Thank you for helping me. Yes. They're As very an American, sp- I'm kind of blushing over here because this is not considered polite conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> way too Dutch for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. Okay. But yeah, you said uh, you were talking about boobs. Yes. Like, you know, women don't have pockets, right? Like, so few of her clothes get decent pockets. So yeah, we use our like I put I have my phone in my bra a lot. Yeah, I stick my like flat smartphone under my bra strap when yeah. I'm like running around because so often the pockets, even in my clothes that do have pockets, if I lean over, it falls yeah. straight out. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I do. So they are very like like bras are very useful, can be very useful, very restricting, but can be very useful. And we put a lot of stuff in there, so don't be weirded out. I've wow. totally hid money in there when I was traveling in places that weren't safe. Yeah. 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 Although I sometimes use shoes for that as well, depending on what shoes I'm wearing. I was wearing sandals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a safe place too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so you, 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 like, I, I, I remember you saying that you wanted to um, also talk a little bit about, you know, don't, don't this is what you should never call boobs ever again oh melons please stop calling boobs melons also the word perky and boobs is way overused i think i'm scarred for life after researching this episode um if anyone wants to go and see why go look up men writing women badly threads they are on tumblr twitter um reddit etc go have fun and then just don't do it <laughs> yeah i'm just thinking like because perky right just the word like just like i have a degree in in linguistics right so it means cheerful and lively or cheeky mm-hmm. that's really all i have to say about that and also you know unless there's a really good reason to reference it bra sizes are not universal so your audience may not understand them male readers often do not know bra sizes to start with and you know bra sizes you already mentioned it bra sizes change between brands yes and women's bra sizes will change over the course of the month for some of us As i will and over their lives oh yeah believe me yes at some point, I've owned bras in like four different sizes at the same time. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. I'll never forget this Tom Clancy book I read when I was like, I think I was 14 or 16. 
where this middle-aged guy looks at a woman that he's going to meet later. He just looks at her with her clothes on, like in a public setting. And then just based on that, uh, because of all the women he's been with, he goes into a store in a foreign country and buys her a bra, feeling that he can judge her size. And then hooray, that night in the hotel, he's exactly right. And she just puts the lingerie on and like compliments him on being so good at picking her lingerie out. And I nearly put the book down right then, even though I was a teenager, because no, that's not how it works. <laughs> no. Tom Clancy has amazing research skills for military equipment, operations, but that just felt like sloppy writing catering to his male readers. It was really unbelievable, uh, especially since the character was in a foreign country where sizes I know are different than the country of origin where this guy came from and said he knew bra sizes from. Yes, and also, you know, women, and you know you know that, and I know you know this because you used to live in China, it can also be really hard to get certain sizes if you are in a country that you're not from. Yes, if you're in a country where women are typically a different size from you, it can be almost impossible especially if you have a very large chest in a small band size or just are large in general. There yeah, are many so, countries where that's difficult. Yeah, so know this and maybe use it in a plot somewhere. No, I would only buy bras when I came back to the U.S. on trips. So it was like once or twice a year I could shop. I have like, I, 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 I didn't even try buying bras here. Like all the bras I have, I bought in the Netherlands because I know exactly which brand. It took me years, but I know exactly which brand caters to me. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. One more thing. Women writers actually seem to write about bras less than men writers, in my experience. I wonder why. This is why I was bringing it up because so many male writers I've read seem to be confident writing about it. And I'm like, you're really getting it wrong. This might be a bombshell for a lot of male listeners but we don't actually like wearing bras it's like the one garment we take off when we get home during during the pandemic <laughs> none of the women I knew were still wearing bras right I've become very comfortable sitting in front of zoom not wearing a bra the most unbelievable thing about some horror movies is that a woman resting would be walking around in her bra. That bra is off. <laughs> yes. And she's probably wearing some oversized t-shirt with food stains on it or something. Yeah. That's yes, in a natural habitat. I heard a lot of women talking. They were like, oh, the pandemic's over. That means I had to put a bra on again. I don't think mine even fits anymore. <laughs> Exactly. Like I am not. Yeah. Yeah. So to a certain extent, I think our, our boobs are very happy with this pandemic. Silver lining ish. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so while yeah. we're talking about going back to boobs again, I'm going to give a shout out to Game of Thrones and a few other movies because they got something right about boobs and armor. Their, um, their female armor actually or good stuff. Do you want to talk about that? Well, yes, because this is the thing, right? That we often see is that we often see in, in fantasy that the armor has like separated boob plates. I think that is the technical term, boob plates. Yeah, which is yeah. But the thing is, <laughs> separated boob plates are like a really good way for a woman to get killed because it's like you know the centerpiece is just resting there on the bone. Yes. And if you look at male breastplates, nothing's resting on the bone. So there is this amazing trans man, Sam the Sword on Twitter, seriously has amazing videos pre and post transition. I've been watching him for years on and off. And he educates reenactors and creators on armor for women and men. But at one point he wrote this about um, armor and weapon. Here's a short excerpt from something that he wrote back in 2013. I do suggest you read the whole thing, but here's what I'm going to quote. What I contest is that there is really 
there really is more danger of falling in boob plate than in falling unarmored or in a flatter plate on account of having two overinflated steel spheres getting in the way. The design of, quote, twin domed, unquote, boob plate is clumsy, awkward, and of very little practical value to a fighter. Breasts are meant to move around, not be permanently fixed in place like Han Solo in Jabba's dungeon. Overall, double dome boob plate is a hazard, not only to the wide-eyed opponent. But you said like there are actually some good examples of armor for women in film, like Chris, uh, Kirsten Stewart's armor in Snow White and the Huntsman, for example. That was really good. Yeah, and Queen Elizabeth the first, like in the in Elizabeth the Golden Age. I mean, she doesn't also very good, right? She doesn't fight, but she wears it when reviewing the army, um, and they're both more practical. So, if you write female protagonists who wear armor. Go have a look at those if you are, you know, needed some proper practical and non-sexist stuff. And pretty much all the female armor in Game of Thrones, everything I've looked at, they got their armor for females spot on. Yeah. yeah. So if you have, like, I have, <laughs> I might be the only person by now who haven't watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> so I, I would know that. But yeah, you can also just, you know, Google an image or something. All right. So let's continue into more things that will make most Americans blush. I, I, love I, didn't think, <laughs> I, I didn't think about that when we prepped this for it's it's yeah it's it's hilarious yeah I will talk about this but I know how people here some people I know will react and so if I was in a different country I would probably not be blushing but I'm here but I'm going to talk about it anyway so we were just talking about boobs and it seems like a good place to just continue on from here and like you said, you're European. So as I prepped for this worse. episode, worse. Dutch. <laughs> that is worse. That is worse, yeah. So as I prepped for, for this episode, I certainly got a full head of steam around the descriptions and uses of female anatomy. And I'm going to directly address men here for just a second. Men. Please, 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 if you have a woman going to the bathroom experiencing a period, childbirth, pregnancy, recent childbirth, etc., get a sensitivity reader. It turns out that statistically over half of you do not know the basics of female health and anatomy. And I'm really scared of what you're writing when a large percentage of you still think that urine and babies come out of the same anatomical tube. It's also startling how many women also get the basics of anatomy wrong and explains some of my serious discomfort when reading certain spicy het romance books. But seriously, if you're going to write about something, please, please check your facts. At least women usually have some sort of lived experience to limit how wrong they can get. But people are getting things very wrong on occasion. Yeah, I call it in the last episode, we, we uh, referenced a YouGov and I think there's a link, I'll put a link in this one as well. So according to them, again, this makes me cringe so badly. And not because I'm, you know, too polite to talk about it, but just because I can't believe it. 45% of women in the UK could not correctly label the anatomy between their own legs. So this is not US we're talking about, we're talking about the UK here. 60% of men could not label the vagina in the study. 31% of men and 29% of women did not know what the clitoris was or what it did. So this is the UK. I have no idea what the numbers are in the rest of the world, but this scares me. It's pretty bad in the US. Our sex education is pretty poor overall. I'm kind of sorry for what kind of sex some people are having because of that, not even being sarcastic. In high school, I was taught women didn't have orgasms. So I feel for everyone who is similarly well, uh, similarly uninformed. If women um, don't have orgasms, what is wrong with me? <laughs> sorry. That, no. was, that was not a fact. That was, that was a misteach. Uh -huh. It's a myth. Yes, women have orgasms. But this means that as writers, we're all coming from a patchwork network of porn and poor sex education when we start to write. 
and many of us include sex or allusions to sex in our writing. Yeah. So this is one place where you should start to expect to get called out when you get it wrong. And it is pretty easy to correct ourselves before we publish something that is incorrect. Not only can it be dangerous to get these things wrong since we know readers do take their education from fiction, but you can also be supporting men and women in continuing to have unrealistic expectations of sex or having awful sex. I read this book years ago. I forget the book and the author probably for a good reason, but the author had the man drilling his female romantic interest in the ass and then her vagina and then back again without any prep, without hygiene, and apparently without any health consequences for the woman afterwards. He didn't even use or change condoms when going from one orifice to the other, I was horrified. It ruined the book for me. Oh, God. I mean, that's the kind of book that government should ban. (laughs) Okay, so we don't have time, and not all our listeners are going to need an anatomy lesson, but we are going to, um, anatomy lesson, sorry, but we are going to bring up a couple of points and do want to stress that unless you've had, like, excellent sexual education, If you end up anywhere near these topics in your plot, please, you need to check your facts. Okay, so this is going to be fun. (laughs) Here's point one. No, women do not have control over when their period shows up unless they take a type of birth control that gives them some measure of control. No, women cannot hold their period like they hold urine. Listen to what Bethany said before. It's not the same anatomical tube. And no, women do not all have their periods on the same day each month. Although, yes, we do tend to sink, but not globally or even communally. Yeah, I was laugh crying when I went to see how prevalent these misconceptions were. Because I knew they existed, but I didn't know how widespread they were. So here's a few other things that um, I felt I needed to debunk. (laughs) Babies are not literally in a woman's stomach. They grow in a uterus. Food does not come down on the baby's head when we swallow while pregnant. So if you're writing pregnancy, please look at some diagrams. They are readily available online. And if you need to write about someone who's out of touch, there's actual real life examples you could include in your book, which would probably make them hilarious. And then you could do a public service announcement and tell everyone the right thing while you're writing about this person who's out of touch. But I digress. Truth does seem stranger than fiction in what some people believe. Additionally, you cannot throw up a baby when you are having morning sickness. This is also something that some people believe. Yeah, I read that recently about a guy who got upset with his wife for having morning sickness because he was terrified she was throwing up their unborn child. And that does make me wonder whether sex ad is just that much better in the Netherlands or whether we as teenagers had better access to teenage magazines that honestly discuss these things. Maybe it's just because we're not so embarrassed to talk about it. I don't know. But like we have a few more. But I do want to say, because you said they grow in a uterus. Because we've just, I'm just realizing how badly informed some people are. So the uterus and the womb are the same thing. Yes. Yeah. In, in, you know, just in case you're going, I thought kids were like, babies were growing in a womb. Yes, it's the same thing. Uterus, womb is the same thing. Okay. But next point. Evidently, and this uh, uh, is a really, just makes me feel a lot of pain. There are some men who think women get pleasure from wearing tampons. That is not the case. Some women, me included, don't even like wearing tampons because they are that uncomfortable. In my case, they actually cause me pain. Also, and I can't believe I have to say this, menstrual pads do not go inside the body. That's just tampons and menstrual cups. Moving on. (laughs) All right. Number four, birth control. Evidently, a lot of people are ill-informed about how birth control works. So double check yourself, even if you think you know. And you could use the bad education around birth control to account for a surprise baby or a secret baby in your plot if you want some ideas. Here's a few real life examples of things going wrong. A woman showed up at a doctor's office looking for additional birth control pills early she and her boyfriend had been taking them every day also one guy believed that women could only have sex once a day while on the pill because the pill only held back one load of sperm per pill so go have fun with that the thing is there are there are types of 
birth control that do hold back one load of sperm. That's called condoms. No, but also like 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 what's it called? I don't even know the Dutch word, let alone the English word. Like we used to have like this cream or something. I think I don't oh, think any spermicide. Yeah, it may be. Yes. There's there there are quite a few ways to help with not getting pregnant now. Yeah. And I do think uh, a lot of some of these things are not very common anymore. But so depending on when your novel is set, other practices might be more common. I hadn't even thought of that. But yes, I'm just birth thinking. control didn't exist before a certain point and has changed. And you need to look up the dates to know when. Like the birth control that you can install in your arm is only yeah. a decade or two old I don't know exactly and then IUDs also have a point in time they started so double check your dates yes like I think a lot of people don't know but there are um, uh, I don't know what they're called but like condoms for women they're just called a female condom as far oh, as I know oh, that, that's very convenient but I've never seen one and I I have I don't know anyone who's ever used them but they were in use at some point. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can. Um, and they have. also change about, uh, change depending where you are in the world. Exactly. So, so definitely do your research. It, like you said, even if you think you know what you're, you know what you know, because it turns out a lot of times we don't really know what we think we know. Um, yeah, this isn't birth control, but when I was in China, I had to be very careful which pads I bought because some pads were sprayed with like this chemical that was supposed to like clean things, but it actually just burned all the skin down there. Oh, that sounds awful. Yeah, I can't make this up. And there was a certain kind of really heavy pad that they would sell. One friend sent them as a joke to their friend back in Australia because Australian humor evidently thought this was hilarious. But it was so big, it like came up it, it was the pad itself was so long it like came up to the belly button on one side and all the way as high as that on the other side and I was oh, wow. like what pair of panties can accommodate this kind of pad that it's fun but that is it, it's it's fun of uh, fun it's, it's it's interesting and like you said like context is so important like when I just moved here the time it took for me to find a brand that sell that sold pads without wings. I think that took me six months. Wow. Well, in the Netherlands, it's 50-50. Each brand, so they sell the same brands here as they sell in the Netherlands. But for some reason, they don't sell the wingless version of those brands. So I think I'm now using little, littles, I don't know if little is a thing in the US. But it's a, it's not a, that I know of. Okay, it's a German German supermarket chain. So I now use their their own brand. They're the only ones I could find on the island that had no wings. So that is also something that you don't think about. Because when you are in a different place, you might not find your regular your character might not find their regular tampons or and has to sort of adjust. It can be part of the whole. I'm in a new place. Shit. What do I do? When I was an expat, a lot of us expat women would bring several months of supplies of menstrual products with us whenever we went to a new country, knowing we were going to have to look yeah, to find something. Also, if you're a very short woman, regular tampons can be too long for like activity. Or if you're a very young woman and you have to wear a tampon for swimming or something, it's better if you can find like the juniors or they sell tampons that are shorter so it doesn't restrict your movement when you're wearing them something yeah. most people don't know anyway have we done our public service announcements on this <laughs> yes i think so i think all so. right so shall we talk about feminized descriptions and words to avoid are we ready for that yes i'm just looking at our notes i think yeah i, I think i just wanted to sum up that this is not like, I, I know we laugh about this, right? But it's, 
this is not necessarily anyone's fault, even though all of this information is available online, there's nothing you cannot find online, right? This, this is all stuff that I learned in biology class, but you can find all of this online. Like it's, it's, there's no reason for you not to know, but that there's, it's also not really your fault because we do know that depending on where you're from, sex ad is really bad. And in some cases, people don't even get sexual education. Especially so, if you've been raised in a repressive environment where a woman doesn't even know what she looks like because you're not supposed to touch yourself before your man does. That there are communities like that. And yes, it's okay, even if you are a woman and you're like, I don't know, it's all right. Wherever you're starting, go ahead and start. Believe me, life gets better once you know these things. Yeah. And it just goes to show that it's 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 not just men who who write this. No, wrong. it's not. It's, We're it's talking also, to everybody. Yeah. So yeah, just just look online. It's very like the the information is there. Yeah. Have you reached that sweet place where you've written out your entire story? It's a wonderful feeling. You've worked so hard for this, spent so many long hours at the keyboard or talking to yourself via recorder, then going over it again at the computer. It's been mostly internal work and it's often been alone. But now it's time to take it from rough to polished. And for that outside perspective is essential. Let me help you. As a developmental editor, I, Bethany A. Tucker, We'll take your hand, sort through your draft, answer your questions, and help you polish it until your work shines. You don't have to do this alone. It doesn't matter if this is your first book or your 10th book, whether you've published this book already and want to make it better, or you're teetering on the edge, eager to publish for the first time. Together, we can take your book to the next level. Contact me via links in the show notes or at theartandscienceofwords at gmail.com to take the next step. So um, feminized description. All right. So let's talk about specific words that can be hot potatoes, yeah. but are kind of ingrained in our lexicons. This is going to include physical and personality descriptions. Yeah. And there's a lot of lists out there and we've included a few of them in our show notes you to, to look at, but we do want to list some of these out here because we know you might be listening on the go. All right. So I'll just take a few of these words and then you want to take the next set? Sure. All right. I'll start by saying that all these words are not quite the same as the racial slurs we talked about at the end of season two. Not all of these words are necessarily bad, but they are all gendered, even though they're just adjectives. Be really, really intentional about using them and just think twice about it. Ask yourself, would I apply this to a man ever? Why or why not? Do I still want to use it? So here we go. Airhead, ambitious. This word has been studied and applied to men positively and women negatively, like the studies bear out that usually when it's applied to a woman, it's negative and yeah. it's pretty much 100% positive when applied to men. Abrasive, usually used to describe what would be called aggressive in men and possibly a positive trait in men, but is pretty much always negative when applied to women. Yeah. Bitchy. Don't think I need to explain that one. Alchi. I had to look this one up. It's not something I would use or hear in America. Bossy. Very, almost always negative. And I think a lot of us girls growing up who were like pushing or trying to get somewhere got called bossy. Yeah. Bubbly. It's called, it's called being, showing leadership potential. Yes. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, you were saying. No, no, no problem. Bubbly. This is not necessarily a bad word, but it's often used to relegate a woman to a non-professional role or no authority or leadership wherever she's at. Oh, if she's bubbly, then she's like, if she's happy all the time, then we can't trust her. Yeah, there's not a lot of, when I think of the word bubbly, I think there's not a lot of depth there. Yeah. Shallow. Yeah. Not necessarily the brightest crayon. Yeah. That's what I did. Ditsy is uh it's kind of like bubbly but not as happy. <laughs> um emotional. Again, how often would you say a man gets emotional or or is emotional? Mostly just hear that applied to women. Yeah. 
the is emotional as a blanket character statement is usually applied to feminine characters as well. And then number 10, frigid. This one is especially problematic. Yeah, because it's not about women's agency. It's about her not responding sexually in the way a man wants. And if she doesn't want him, she must be frigid. Yeah, I haven't seen it used often in texts published in the last 10 or so years, but it's in the canon. So next word, frumpy. I think we've all heard this one. Yeah. And then, yeah, high maintenance, high maintenance, a very gendered term. But I am starting to hear this applied to men, but usually only men in an LGBTQ space. And so far, I've only personally seen it in books. I haven't heard it personally. Of course, COVID has kept me out of certain big public spaces for a while. You say that like it's a bad thing. It depends. I do like people. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to link these next two words, hormonal and hysterical. Guys can't be both of these things, but we pretty much only use these terms to apply to women, or in a few cases, disabled males. And I'm not referring to hysterical here in the way that it would be used to say that someone is really good at comedy or telling funny stories. That's different. Which is also because women are not considered funny. So I would say that in the comedy, or rarely, right? It's very like I've read research upon research on this way back when I was still university, that a lot of men do not laugh at the same jokes if they are told by a woman. So his, his hysterical and comedy, then it suddenly becomes a male thing. It's really interesting how that works. I just want to say as well that hyster- hysterical is so gendered that when soldiers turn the f- so hysterical in the medical, the medical you sense. You the word? Yeah. When, when soldiers during the First World War were starting to develop the exact same symptoms as had been previously seen only what were called hysterical women, so women who fainted on the spot, became numb, had like all kinds, like were in high emotional distress and psychologists at the time and, and psychoanalysts at the time didn't really know who, what to do with it. So when men started having those same exact symptoms, they considered an entirely new condition and they came up with a new name for it, shell shock. You know, from the shells that, because yeah. for those not familiar with the First World War, it was um, a war that was fought in the trenches. But a lot of shell- shelling. Yeah, constant shelling, yeah. So I'm hoping it's starting to become obvious just how gendered our use of terms is. Like we, they've actually came up with mm-hmm. a new term. term just because you couldn't apply hysterical to male patients. Because it was yeah, such yeah. a gender thing. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a couple no- more words that are gendered. Pushy, shrill, voluptuous. The last word isn't bad. Voluptuous isn't necessarily bad. But it places women in a particularly sexual lens. And that should be handled with care with regard to her agency as a character. Mm-hmm. I would say that a word with less of a sexual connotation that kind of says the same thing, could be curvy. What do you think? In the US, at least, curvy is often used to describe plus size women in a more positive way. So it's moving away from the same meanings as voluptuous, but there is a lot of overlap. Right. So another thing we definitely need to mention here, I think, is that the words can have a different connotation depending on where you are and who you're talking to. So take that into account. Exactly. All right, next word is winging. This is a British word. It's whinging. Whinging? Whinging, yes. See, I, thank you. I've never heard it in American English, obviously. And as an American, it kind of makes me laugh. However, my research said that this is a gendered word to say someone is complaining. Men are often cast as pointing out something is wrong, but women are cast as complaining in professional and personal environments. And that's what this term might apply to. It's definitely also used to refer to men, but always in a way to emasculate them, right? So there's definitely that feminine connotation. Oh, great. Yeah. So even worse. Next, working mum or working mother, working mom. They're all the same thing. 
We never say that a man is a working dad. It prioritizes one aspect of a woman's possible function over whatever else she's doing and can give credence to the idea that a woman shouldn't be promoted or given the same amount of money or increased responsibility because, quote unquote, she's not all in. It's, it's basically naturalizing that women are born to be mothers and men are born to achieve things. And you can say what you want about Freud. So Sigmund Freud, I'm talking about here. But he was right on point when describing gender roles in society. Like we're still learning to undo what he noticed back in the early 1900s, which includes that the only real role for women in society was believed to be that of mother. Yeah. So I'm going to jump in with a similar word, housewife. It's, it's used a lot, but it has connotations that can be really limiting and give certain impressions to a reader. So think carefully about labeling a character like that. It can back you into a corner or limit the reader's imagination. I hear a lot of people replacing housewife with homemaker. It sounds so much nicer. And it's not. And active. Yes. And it also like points out the fact that there's immense amount of skill necessary for that. It's labor. Yeah. Labor and knowledge just should be professional. So I do resist calling myself a housewife, even though sometimes I have definitely fallen into that category, mostly because of the power dynamic tied up into that. That's another podcast, not necessarily a writing podcast. I want to respect women who do use this term and value it and take a lot of pride in it. And in some societies, it, it is respected. Um, society would not function without the work that women do in the home or a man who runs a home would do does in a home so that being said I'm having a lot of fun watching this Japanese show called house husband there's a live version and an animated version on Netflix right now it's hilarious this ex yakuza uh, who's a Japan yeah a Japanese mafia strong man He's like an assassin kind of person. He takes on, he, he, he stops being a uh, Yakuza and he takes on the role of house husband for his professional wife. He swears off doing crime and he brings the same intensity and fire and over the topness to housekeeping and feeding and caring for his wife as he did his former like strongman role. And it's so, so precious. Like, him watching him get bleach stains out of clothes it just had me rolling on the floor I think I put my head down the desk and was cry laughing over it he's like so furious and then he like lectures someone on the proper herbs it's and it the show is so precious because it shows just much how much skill and talent that he has to learn and he doesn't know and he like goes takes classes for it and stuff I've heard people use the term house husband but I've seen it mostly in reference to gay couples, men. Really? Yeah. So that is that is problematic in itself <laughs> because you still get this sort of gender that you know in a same sex relationship you need to have a, um, a, a sort of somebody who performs the male role and somebody who performs the feminine role. And I I do hope at some point I haven't had that question in ages about my own relationship, and I do hope that one day it'll just die that question who's the man in your relationship (laughs) okay (laughs) that's gonna be particularly annoying yeah here's another word oh sorry for it no i was gonna Uh, say what is the next word uh femme fatale urban dictionary defines this term as a woman with both intelligence and sex appeal that uses these skills to manipulate poor helpless men into doing what she wants may cause death Hmm. I didn't know what that term meant until a few weeks ago, actually. I can see it as an issue, as an archetype, but I'm not sure I'd avoid using the term for a recognizable archetype. I just wouldn't write the archetype necessarily. Like Maleficent is an amazing film in two parts with a character that could be cast like this, but the character's development is taken further and done really well. I do think we're moving away from this sort of stereotypical characterization. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of fatal attraction kinds of films coming out recently. And that was like the femme fatale film. Like there was this whole period in Hollywood that the femme fatale film was like really, it was really out there. But it's still a loaded term, especially since, you know, femme fatales are everything that a good woman isn't supposed to be. So it reinforces that dichotomy. 
Got it. Yeah. Okay, what do you think of the term trashy? Oh, just don't use it for anybody. Unless, unless you have it being shown to be in really bad taste. It's not only slut shaming, but it's often class shame. So double no. Not a word to be written and, and, and written and allowed to lay in a positive manner. Yeah, I, I would say the same goes for koi. I'm just voting no on this straight up, like very much reinforcing this whole virgin whore dichotomy. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much down with the green that this word does support rape culture. I would say historically, the word has had some better connotations. There are times when I've read it in a book and I'm like, yeah, I have no problem with the word's yeah. definition here in this sentence. I know what you so mean. it's not black and white, but there are different ways. I'm like, no, that, that's supporting rape culture. Yeah, if you use it in any contemporary settings, no. No, don't do it. Uh, so how, how do you feel about tomboy? I do not want to take this word away from anyone for whom it has been liberty, liberating, like a rebellious and helpful identity. That said, I do think it points to limiting roles we've historically allowed girls in telling a girl that she's not being a girl by being a tomboy. Yeah, it's kind of saying, it's kind of limiting what a girl could be instead of just broadening the definition of girl to include yeah. these types of girlhood. Yeah. So yeah, I think it can be both limiting and freeing. So yes, use it if it fits your character, but do think through how you're using it. Okay, so there are a ton of insulting labels just for women out there, more than we realized when we started working on this episode. <laughs> Using them to characterize a female character is lazy writing and summarizes someone down to just one perceived set of traits without regard for why they are acting the way they are acting. acting. So a couple of these words, and we do include uh, some of those lists in the show notes, like I said, nag, shrew, ice queen, fishwife, gossip, diva. I think some areas are reclaiming the word diva, but it's still a mix of positive and negatives at the moment. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely always a negative, there is some, some level of negativity around it, yeah. So, the, like I said, there are actually hundreds of these words, and I am going to put the links in the show notes for you. The thing is that we as women are still in danger of using almost all these words on each other on our characters and in our descriptions in fiction, even building characters on stereotypes without consciously taking everything else into account. And this can lead to very thin characterization of our female characters. So just be wary, I would say. I think awareness, yeah. is, awareness is, is where we start getting things right. I would agree totally on awareness. I would say especially in some of my books, I'm not stripping all of these words out of my text, but I am choosing who uses them and why. Exactly. And making yeah. sure I frame them in a way that I'm not encouraging the use of these words. Like I have one character who definitely gets called numerous ones of these words because they hate her and they're scared of her. So they throw all kinds of labels at her. And I use some of these words when they're using them to show just how scared they are. Yes, she's I just, literally I a fire witch, and they did her wrong. I was wrong. just gonna say, I know, I know exactly who you're talking about, and she <laughs> is amazing. Like she's my role model. Yeah. yeah. So there are times to use these words, but I definitely make sure I don't allow any of my characters who are not on character growth paths, who are considered to be like strong stand-up members of the cast, to use them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we've already talked about point of view a little bit, but I think we need to talk about it some more. You ready for that? Yes. All right, so issues of POV. There are levels here, starting with the point of view of the author, namely who the author is. So we're talking about ourselves here as writers and how we're approaching our topic, character, plot, etc. And then below that, there's the actual point of view the POV, as we say, when we choose to write inside a person, a particular character's head in the book itself. Yes, like our own experiences and identities as writers will give us different sets of blind spots and hangups, just as they give our characters based on their experience and identities. And we should be aware of that as we write our female characters and all our other characters, really. 
I don't think we need to go into that deeply, but if you're just starting to listen to this podcast, we suggest you go back to season one for more on ways to find our own blind spot as writers and work with them. There's some checklists for you to check out, but for the moment, let's have a short laugh. <laughs> I'm just, I know what's coming, so I'm just laughing already. Let's have, uh, let's look at some men writing women examples. I think the example that takes the cake is author Stuart Woods in his book, Desperate Measures. <laughs> yes, in this, in this book, I haven't, actually, I haven't read it. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to either. He has a body identified by the woman's ID, which is hidden in a tiny purse that she'd placed in her vagina before going out for a nice night, nice night out on the town. It's described as being just large enough for a few bills, her ID and the credit card. Because all of us girls just reach between our legs when we go for a party to get our cash. I... I was hoping that this purse got placed there after she died. I mean, if you want to get rid of someone's idea, there are better ways to do it, aren't there? Like they are, you know, they're going to check there. Anyway, yeah, like as a based on the snippet alone, I don't want to read the book and, and find out. And I was like, we just talked about that tampons can be extremely uncomfortable for some. So I'm just like, no. Okay. Well, Well, I did my research. I wanted to make sure that this author wasn't being unfairly called out. I stocked the book on Goodreads. And um, I, w- I was thinking that the killer put the purse there after death. But no, it looks legit. Uh, it looks like the author really did decide that the woman was going to use her vagina like a pocket. It's book 47 in a series, according to Goodreads. And Evidently, the lead character in this book is just sleeping with everyone, and everyone happens to be young, drop-dead gorgeous, and from a small town in southern Georgia, or something like that. So the remarks in many of the reviews made me laugh, especially now that I'm in Georgia, and I kept just thinking, if there are this many blondes from Georgia that he's sleeping with in one book, the population in Georgia must be falling. Because he's not in Georgia, he's in New York. Yeah, but I'm just, if he's been sleeping with so many women, you think he'd know. You would think. But, yeah. Anyway, but I, I'm going to go on a limb here and suggest that maybe perhaps he needed a sensitivity reader. I'm not sure his core audience cared, especially since his ratings are so high for this book on um, where, he, where the book's being sold. But he certainly has lost readers over this scene. I do think, though, that it's a really good idea for men and women to check with the opposite gender in these kinds of moments. And if you're non-binary or writing non-binary, check on whatever you haven't personally gotten up close and personal with yet. Yeah. So that is the POV of the author. Like, check yourself. Yes, I think that covers it. I know we ran into some interesting bits on women writing men, though less so, but you're saving that for your episode on that. So that's next month's episode, right? Like yes, when you, next yeah. month's episode. Okay. I think we have to save that and stay on topic. Yeah. Moving on from anatomy. Again. Another thing that's been noticed, this is also more for men than women when writing women, is on the level, again, like, this, so we're still on the level of the author's POV, right? Male authors tend to write and introduce female characters based on looks and in the same work, write and introduce male characters based on presence, job or character. So personality. I'm not actually going to blame men here for this, but it's something that we should all check in our writing because we all can run into this trap. It starts when we compliment little girls on their pretty dress and talk about how capable little boys are and what a picture arm or something that he has extrapolate that into descriptions of middle-aged characters and you find yourself talking about the confident men in a suit engaged in in an important cell phone call and contrast that against the tired middle-aged mother dragging home groceries with all the last 20 pounds of her three-year-old's pregnancy weight holding her back. Basically, make sure you're not using appearance in place of personality or capability as you're crafting your character. And I think this bears repeating 
be careful that you stay in the POV of the character in the book and not accidentally hop into your own POV. For example, we don't want to glamorize a character that we find glamorous unless the character in which we're writing also finds them glamorous and has good reason to find them glamorous. This is so, so important, especially if you're writing a POV of a gender that you are not. Double check yourself. Yes. And again, unless we are in Omni POV, which is usually just the author's viewpoint. So tallying up how we do something like actually making a list. I described this character based on this and I described this character like this. And then deciding if that's the kind of writer we want to be can be helpful for getting around our blind spots. And that goes for all genders and descriptions. Yeah. So POV when it comes to writing female characters is going to be a bit different, right? whether it's a woman describing herself, a male POV describing a female character, or an omniscient voice describing a woman or commenting on something that a woman does. As we've discussed in our last episode, not it's not our last episode, it's the first episode of this season on hair and head coverings, sometimes a POV won't know something. And we as writers will be locked inside the reference points we've set up for our POV character. And that's okay, even when it's not flattering on occasion. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to get around an unflattering description that we need to write because it's true to the character. For example, a POV character can have their eyes opened later in the story. Another character can tell them off. Or we can even write a POV character in a way that the reader wants the hero of the story to, quote unquote, go down or or be changed. Yeah. Like one thing I will circle back to here is... Even if the POV is limited, the author needs to know enough to get descriptions right. So it can be described in the best possible way. So specifically, you know, for writing women characters, this might mean, well... Mm, Not believing a woman wants a credit card and cash up her vagina like a pocket? Yeah, yeah, let's let's, let's go with that. Like, we do need more pockets, but yeah. I, I hope that book doesn't sell. No, it does. It does. Um, I looked up some statistics and it looks like it makes uh, $150 a month on Amazon alone. Been out a while. (sighs) (laughs) Okay, so I know I said something about writing worlds you want to live in so people can read about worlds they would like to live in. But again, like there are better ways to solve our lack of pockets. To be fair, I'm pretty sure a large percentage of readers in this genre are men who like the author, may not know any better or do not care. But this is not encouraging for supporting writers and doing better. And also it makes me feel really icky about what men do not know. Some men, some Some men do not know. (laughs) Hashtag not all men. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we need better language because painting all men like this. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I know so many good men who do know these things. I will point out how well other books and films that are getting it right are doing because they are getting it right and they are making a lot of money. Stuart Woods might be big in his genre and a New York Times bestseller for his last 20 book, 24 books or so, but he does not stack up against the absolute staying power of say the alien films franchise starring Riley, who was much more practical about everything, including saving her cat. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't even know who Stuart Woods is. Like, I've never heard of this. This. So when you said that he was selling well and that he was an actual bestseller, I was like, oh, that is interesting. Um, but I do want to mention, because, yeah, we have stuff like the Alien Film franchise, but I've recently become obsessed with the works of Alice, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, Osman. Osman? She is the writer behind the new Netflix series Heartstopper. I don't know if you've watched it already. Not yet. Is it good? Yes, I've, I've, I've watched it for eight or nine times. How do you watch so much Netflix? <laughs> I don't know how you do it. But they're like they're like 23 minute episodes. And they're like okay. eight of them. Okay. I'm, I'm impressed by how much you can how much you can cover. But yeah, what about her? Addicted. I'm also reading all her novels at the moment. So you mentioned you looked up Stuart Woods on, on Publisher Rocket. So I opened my own version of Publisher Rocket and 
to check what somebody like Alice Oseman is making right now, right? And I didn't even add up all versions of the 10 books she has currently out, but she's estimated to make 600,000 American dollars on Amazon alone per month. And so, she's yeah. getting these kind of things right. She's writing really well. She is writing um, very diverse books, like characters with diverse sexualities, diverse problems. She's not afraid to touch upon really dark stuff, right? So it's very, it's, it's, it's just really, it's doing it well, basically pays off. That's just what I was saying. Like he might be, you know, making $150 with this one book, but $600,000 on Amazon alone. And, if, and I do know this, this is because the series Heartstopper is doing really well on Netflix right now. They just announced it is going to be a season two and three. Very cool. Means it's doing really well. Um, but yeah, it, it does it does pay off doing it well. So I know you wanted before we before we uh, end this, you wanted to look at some s- strong female characters or like b- female characters that are written well that we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, and just finish this episode off, this two part episode, with some examples of like good practice. Yeah, so let's take a look at the strong female character trope first, because I think we need to tackle that. In fact, we talked about making this an entire episode, but we decided that we need to touch on it here. And I said like strong female characters, but that's actually, I think we're so used to calling them that, but it's actually, yeah. it's it's a bit more controversial than that. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so w- I was reading this New York Times opinion piece um, I Don't Want to Be the Strong Female Character by Britt Marlinger. And I thought Britt just hit the nail on the head in so many ways. So I do encourage readers to go read that piece if they can. The, the problem or perhaps the conundrum in many cases, the strong female character is literally written as strong in mass terms. Like it's, it's a being a powerful executive or a political with real power, an assassin or a soldier, the woman has this tame status due to strength, much the way we assign it to men. I've seen it described as a male character in a body I'd like to fuck, or a male character who wears a tank top better. Yeah, and I don't think either of us are saying that these characters aren't fun to read or watch or can't be role models. They absolutely can. But as mentioned in the article, it's, it's still kind of really playing out a male story in a female body. Mm. I, I do believe in everyone being human first and other identities afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there was a, a film that I thought did this really well in writing and acting called The Old Guard, a 2020 film starring Charlie's Theron. Theron's character leads a group of immortal mercenaries that protect humanity in a very understated way. The cast itself is wonderfully balanced. The action scenes are intense as any shoot up adventure thriller out there. And there's an emotional heart that just drives the plot. So I don't really have a problem with the main concept or presentation of a physically strong, strong female character. I think what's really needed is just an expansion of the definition and like a broadening of what kind of story gets told. Yes, it's not enough to swap out genders. We need to explore the stories that perhaps we haven't centered as much in bodies that are across the spectrum. So I have to say I haven't seen it in a few years, but I adored watching the Shrek films because of Fiona. She's so supposedly cursed to be an ogre, but Shrek unlike Belle and Beauty and the Beast, is allowed to keep the form of the one he falls in love with, namely Fiona. She thinks she's going to change and become this beautiful human. He meets her as an ogre, falls in love with her in the body of an ogre, and she stays in that body afterwards. I suppose that some could argue that Fiona, quote unquote, changed for her man here. I think there's multiple readings that can be done of the storyline, but I personally thought that she was attractive, both green and pale. And the reading that I experienced when watching was that she didn't have to be whatever her idea of perfect was to be genuinely loved. And that felt really, really good watching it. All right. So let's wrap up this. um, Well, we've talked about this for a while. Uh, This this long, if you put it together, this very long episode. I think 
Jandy Nelson writes great adult women in her YA fiction. In I'll Give You the Sun, which is one of my favorite books, the mother is complex, flawed, exceptionally loving, terribly intelligent and gifted, misguided from time to time, beautiful, mysterious, smothering. She cheats on her husband. And then there's the grandmother in The Sky is Everywhere. And this woman is like wonderfully peculiar. She's caring, loving. She can also get angry. She's strict. She's a very talented painter who's obsessed with the color green, but she's also lost and in pain and she's grieving. So there's so much to both these characters and it all makes sense within the story and their personal backgrounds. And they are like this because of what they've survived, what they've been through and are going through. And that makes for really well-rounded, relatable secondary characters. Okay. I'm going to go with Violet from Violet Evergarden. The, it's an animated series. The story starts tragic with a war survivor. Violet wakes up without the person she cares about most and without her hands. They've been replaced with highly functional prosthetics. Not to give spoilers, but the series is pretty much about her finding her place in society after everything that's happened in the war. Society is healing from the war. Violet is finding her healing amidst all that while contributing to the healing of those around her. I literally watched with a towel in my hand because I cried so much on occasion. Things were really well done. She's highly motivated by a relationship with a man, though it's not a romantic one, it's complex and deep on both sides. And her journey includes a variety of people in a variety of ages and dispositions. So she's not magically healed by romantic love. She grows, so do those around her. She's not perfect, but she tries. And there are many more examples where those came from because we are getting better at this, right? We are writing better novels already. I just think on the, like, sort of in the bigger picture, the grand scheme of things, we can collectively do better. I think that will be the next step. So do we have any parting words or advice? Yes, a few parting words that we haven't covered yet. We really didn't get to discuss how gender intersects with other identity markers in this episode. And that's not because we're ignoring it, but because we couldn't cover it in our time, even though we doubled how much space we gave this episode as we wrote it. So know that we will be coming back to that. Yes, we will be talking more specifically uh, later on about, amongst others, Black women, Asian women, Latinx women, queer women, trans women, and how they intersect and so on. We will get to this. Yeah, we're also trusting all of you listening to take what you're hearing today and build on it. A lot of these concepts are basic and can be extrapolated out even to things that we didn't state clearly or speak to directly, which is why we covered some of them we covered and didn't cover others that would have been more, you know, repeating the same kind of advice. Yeah, we will certainly be coming back to this topic in various ways, but at least for now, we've tackled a lot and giving you all, giving all of you listening, like something to chew on. And yeah, as yeah. always, we would love to get your comments and thoughts, maybe some good suggestions of novels you've been reading. Yes, so you can email us at diversityinwriting at gmail.com or find us on Facebook, Facebook at Diversity in Writing. We also very much appreciate everyone who is sharing these episodes with their friends and fellow writers. We know you're doing it and we appreciate it. Yes. So next month on the first, like this month, we will be releasing a new episode. And this one will be a little bit different. I am taking some time off to rest, reset and tackle some things like I'm moving, for example. Yes. And mothering three cute little kittens that are literally all over the place. Yes, that too. So you, Bethany, will be running the next couple of months without me. Yes. So for next month, I've asked Luby Tucker, who I've mentioned a few times now on the show, to join me for a conversation about writing masculinity. That seemed fitting as he's a man and also a writer. And a Twitch streamer in video games, and he works in tech. So I'm looking forward to bringing you another, uh, another perspective and breaking down writing better male characters. I am looking forward to it. And I want cat pictures. That's all I'm saying. If I have to do all this podcasting alone, I get cat pictures. That's a deal. I will send you <laughs> all the cat pictures that I have. They're Already. a lot. Be warned. All right. So we will see you again in a couple of months. And Luby Tucker and Bethany Tucker next month. Yes. And I will be listening to you. Awesome.
Thank you for joining us. Music for this show was written and produced by Eric Mills. If you found this episode helpful, please rate and review on your favorite podcast app and spread the word so other writers can find us too. To get our Doing Diversity in Writing Toolkit, which includes all bonus material from Season 1, go to representationmatters.art. That's dot A-R-T. Here you will also find our episode show notes. Happy writing and see you next episode.